Godric, a novel by Frederick Beekner. Chapter 2 of the family of Godric, his youth and a sign from the sea. Adelward the freeman was my father, and Reginald has it that his name means keeper of blessedness. If so, he kept it mostly to himself, more is the pity. I pity Adelward. If he pitied me, he never said. Adelward's face I have long since lost, but his back I can still behold. He held his head cocked sideways, and his ears stood out like handles on a pot, as he strode forth from the smoke of our hut to work on our own scant croft of leeks, parsley, shallots, and the like, or else my lord's wide acres. Endless was the work there was, the seeding, the spreading of dung, reaping and threshing, cutting and storing. In winter there were scythes and plows to mend, the beasts to keep, roofs to patch until your fingers froze. It seemed that he was ever striding off in every way but ours, so I scarcely had the time to mark the smile or scowl of him. Even the look of his eyes is gone. They were gray as the sea, like mine, it said, only full of kindness. But what matter how kind a man's eye be if he never fixes you with it long enough to learn? He had a way of whistling through his teeth, like wind through wattle, and it's like wind that I remember him. His was a power to thump doors open and shut like wind, a gray gust of a man to make flames fly and scatter chaff. But wind has no power to comfort a child, or lend a strong arm to a lad whose bones are weak with growing. If Adelward and Godric meet in paradise, they'll meet as strangers do, and never know. It was fear kept Adelward from us, and next to God what he feared of all things most was an empty belly. He had good cause. He had seen poor famished folk eat rat and cat, and seen grown men suckle their wives for strength enough to ferret nuts to feed them. Bitterer fare than that a man will go to when his belly starts to gnaw itself. So it was his fear we'd starve that made him starve us for that one of all things that we hungered for the most, which was the man himself. The man was ever leaving us. If my lord said harrow, he'd harrow, and tinker, he'd tinker, or fettle, he'd fettle, through, though he was no villain bound to serve but a man born free as any man, and paid the rent of our poor roof with pence. But my lord was all there, was to save us if the harvest failed, so if the hens no longer sat, I think my father would have laid an egg himself to please my lord. He loved us, sure, but like the brat a beggar dreams, his love could never pad the ribs or make the heart grow strong. I sometimes see him to this day in dreams. He sits by the hearth, his back as ever turned. His chin has fallen to his chest. He neither sleeps nor wakes. There's a sack of onions on his knee, and his hands hang dark from grubbing in the earth. I huddle close to him to turn him by his great cold ears, so I can see him plain at last. But Godric's hands close ever shut on empty air, and even in his dreams that face escapes. But Aidwin, my mother, there's another tale. Friend of blessedness, says Scrivener Reginald, and blessed or not, she was a friend to all. What a lass she must have been with her hair in a braid and her rosy cheeks, though it's never as a lass that a man remembers the mother that bore him. I remember her leading a Christmas gig in the churchyard, though till Tom Ball the priest flew out to scold. God in his wrath might keep them jigging the whole year through, Ball said, till they jigged to the depths of their waists in the sod. But sweetheart have pity they went on singing all Christmas Eve, till so wrought was poor Ball that he stammered it forth the next morning at Mass. Sweetheart have pity, he said, when he should have said, Yezu have mercy. How Aidwin stuffed her braid in her mouth at that, or she'd cover her mirth with her hands and shake till you'd think that the fit was upon her. She did the same too when she wept, so you'd never be sure which she hid with her hands, her tears or her cackling. I think there were times she herself didn't know, nor does any one know at times. Laugh till you weep, weep till there's nothing left but to laugh at your weeping. In the end it's all one. It was Berkwin, my sister, that tried her most. Berkwin had ears like Adelwords, which she bound with a cloth at night to lay them flat. It never did. She had long legs and hair in a tangle, and a gap between her teeth for squirting cider, or parry through if ever the whim should take her. You never knew. She could outrun, outjig, outdevil the lads, and it was the lads' toil and lads' sport she fancied. She'd have none of spinning with the women and Aidwin. She loathed staining my lord's wool with woad or vermilion, 
and her loaves were hard and flat as tiles. Edwin would box her big ears, and Adelward would take a rope to her if he'd the strength enough left with it from his grubbing, but it was no use. Off she'd flee to hunt Coney again, or bedevil the ox with his great saint's eye. Brickwin loved the lads, but it was like another lad herself she loved them. I think she was twelve before she learned they carried under their clothes what she herself was clean without. And when they found her flesh sweet and tried to tumble her, it sent her into a terrible fright and puzzle for thinking. She wasn't a lass nor a lad either. There was nothing left for her to be but only Berkwin. So only Berkwin she was. Lonely Berkwin, merry and larkish yet but in her own freaked fashion. She'd harry geese and climb high branches. She'd set the swine loose in Tom Ball's garden. She'd tease the hot lads in a way not to flame but to quench them, she thought, mocking their barnyard lust with speech ruder far than any they knew themselves how to muster. Then Aidwin would cover her face with her hands and toss to and fro like a windy tree. Brother William was Berkwin's one fast friend till Brother Godric stole her off. Godric was older than either, with a breach of years between that came of a stillbirth, and several small deaths no whit less still. Aidwin had hardly been delivered of William when she waxed great with Berkwin, and the two of them grew up like finger and thumb at first. They made a wry pair. Berkwin was merry and mad. Berkwin was Berkwin. William was owlish from the day he was born. When William fixed you with his great round eye, you felt he knew when last you'd done the deed of darkness, and the one you'd done it with and where. When Adelward brought apples or onions back, William would count them out to the last one, and any day you liked could tell the number left, and how the boy could talk. Words came spilling out of him before he knew their meaning, and if there was none to listen, he'd talk to his own ten toes. He didn't care a fig for what he talked about. One matter would serve him as well as another. He'd prattle of Normans or crops or weather till the spittle gathered at the corners of his mouth. And if you made a move to flee, there'd come to his eyes a haunted look, and he'd prattle all the faster so you'd find no chink to flee him through. Words were the line that mo moored him to the world, I think, and he thought if ever the line should break, he'd forever be cast adrift. Berkwin was his chief mooring at the start. Day after day they'd sit at sundown on a stile, their faces dark against the crimson sky, and William ever buzzing in her ear. I don't think Berkwin paid much mind to what he said, but the sound alone worked some spell on her, the way they say that music will on beasts. It soothed and rested her, at least. It gave her peace to gather back the bits and pieces of herself the day had scattered. And I think that William scarcely listened to himself, or cared if she paid heed or not. For it wasn't her heed he sought for with his words. It was herself to make fast to against the world's wild winds that sought to blow him out to sea for drowning. The jest of it was that Godric was the one that almost drowned. It happened thus. I was a lad of twenty-odd, and William and Berkwin both but children still. I was off in the fens one April day to set out snares for the waterfowl, not far from where the wellland flows into the wash. A stiff breeze blew across the saltings, and the air was watery chill. I see it yet, and yet see Godric seeing it as well. He was full of glee and daring then, with a boy's heart still in the downy breast of man. His neck hadn't thickened yet, nor his chest swelled to a ton, nor his nose fleshed out to the great hook it became, but a bird's beak then. He had the sea-gray eyes of Edelward, although with less of kindness in them than a bird's cold glint and cunning. His beard was sparse and short, not yet the great black pricklebush it later grew. His raven hair fell shoulder-long, and save for a skin tied round his waist, he was naked as Father Adam was before his shame. Nor yet knew Godric shame himself, a young beast, sure, but with a beast's young innocence. Then far out across the shingle, where sky-colored sand and water meet, he spied a shape. Something glittered, humped and wet there like a wrecked craft's cargo, or a pirate's carcass sewn with gold along the seams, or something rarer yet washed up from ancient Roman times. For legend is that Caesar drained old wash to plow like meadowland, and buried treasure there. Through the shallows Godric raced, bird-beaked his arms stretched out like wings. 
Splashing silver spray chest high, he was soaked to the bone but never even felt the chill, his blood so full of flame. It was only a fish when he reached it, but ah, such a fish it was. Black-backed and the blunt of snout, it lay on its side with its belly glinting in the sun like a pearl. Its mouth grinned wide and welcome. Its porpoise eyes were glazed and gay in death. Salted down, it would have served to feed a family all through spring or more, so Godric, with his knife set in to gutting it. This was no easy task, for the fish was longer than a man and of a half to match. Godric's blade was slight, and just to cut the thews and bones that held the head took time. Thus he did not mark the freshening of the breeze, and the tide's swift turning till he glanced to find himself upon a spit of sand ringed round with scudding waves. But still there was much work to do. He scoured the empty belly clean with brine. He lopped the tail and the great three-cornered fin. At last he was left with a hundredweight of fillet, which he laid across his shoulders so that, like a bishop's stole, it hung down low to either side. Then, up to his breast, in the surf, he started for the shore. It boiled him like a turnip in a broth. It knocked him off his feet and pounded him. When he opened up his mouth to cry, it filled his mouth. His burden dragged him under, yet he would not let it go, for though the deep turned dark about him, still deeper in his heart he saw that porpoise eye, so blithe in death and heard its voice, or so he thought, say, Take and eat me, Godric, to thy soul's delight, hold fast to him who gave his life for thee and thine. Godric's breath then failed him, he was sucked down by the tide. Berkwin found him. He awoke upon the strand to find her lips on his to breathe life back into him. His head was cradled in her lap. All said it was a miracle, and so I think it may have been. Three lessons Godric learned that day. The first was that the sea's a killer, nor did he ever from that day forget nor fail again to keep an eye cocked on the wave's salt treachery. The second was he learned that Berkwin's heart was his. Less and less, as months passed by, did she seek William out, or sit astride their sundown style to hear him buzz his need at her. More and more it was Godric that she sought for soothing, and he her. They spoke but little. Once she laid his fingers upon his lips, and it said it was her breath they breathed. Who knows but it was so. Lesson three was that he learned whose voice he'd heard beneath the waves and whose the eye that gazed at him so merrily. He learned that it was Yezu that saved him from the sea, though saved him why or saved for what deep end he did not learn, nor has he ever learned to this day.